Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the second day of our April advisory council meeting. Um, it's so great to see everyone today. And we have an exciting agenda that is almost as packed as yesterday's, maybe as packed as yesterday's. Um, so it's going to be a, 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 a tight day with a lot of, of good information um, this morning and important issues that are being raised throughout the, um, both of the days. Uh, because we were unable to hear our um, public commenter yesterday afternoon, we're going to change what we normally do and start with um, a public comment, and then we will pivot to our LTSS panel. So, Chair Armstrong, um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to kick this day off. I wish you all a wonderful day. My name is Kara Armstrong, and I'm the mother of a young adult with Down syndrome, and I'm zooming in from Thousand Oaks, California. I'm speaking to you today as an advocate for the Down syndrome community and an ambassador for the National Down Syndrome Society. Not long after my daughter with Down syndrome, Mia, was born, my dad began to show signs of cognitive impairment, and shortly after that received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. His trajectory with the disease was typical, and it was heartbreaking. I watched my father decline as he lost many of his skills that he once had. And I watched my mom go from having a rich, meaningful life to suffering the isolation and despair of caring for a husband who was slipping further away from her each day. After my mother passed away from pancreatic cancer, I became the sole caregiver for my father when he moved in with me and my family. But after many months, his agitation and impaired mobility were too much for my husband and my children to handle. And placing him in a memory care facility definitely felt like a broken promise to my mom, but keeping my kids safe was my first priority. Alzheimer's disease had turned a man who never uttered an angry word or, an unkind, or ever had an unkind thought into someone that none of us recognized. He passed away six weeks after I had placed him in that facility. As my knowledge of Down syndrome and the associated medical conditions has grown, and I'm also a registered nurse, I was terrified to learn that the lifetime risk of Alzheimer's disease is over 90% for individuals living with Down syndrome. It was agonizing to watch Alzheimer's uh, steal my father's fun-loving personality and to see him become a burden to my mom, to witness his transformation into a scary figure to my children, whom he adored. Even worse, now I have to worry about my beautiful daughter, Mia. Will this be her fate too? I fear for so many like her, many of whom will contract Alzheimer's in their 50s. Yet it feels like our community has gotten little attention from broader Alzheimer's response efforts. But this council and each one of you here today have the opportunity to change that. I'm here to implore you to change that today. And I'm asking that you ensure that individuals with Down syndrome are appropriately included in clinical trials and research and that they have access to new treatments and adequate clinical care, and that there are much needed supports given to caregivers like me who care tirelessly for the ones that we love that are irre irrevocably changed by this disease. My daughter does not deserve to suffer like my father did. She and other members of our beautiful community deserve so much more. I appreciate you listening to me this morning and I wish you a beautiful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kara. Thanks for your words and thanks for joining us so early in the morning. We really appreciate it. Um, without further ado, it's also my pleasure now to turn it over to the other Helen. I can just say how rare it is to have two Helens in the same room, let alone um, kicking off the day. Um, so Helen Bundy Metzger is the chair of our LTSS subcommittee and she's gonna lead us through our day. Thank you, Sister Helen. Here we go. <laughs> And first, I want to acknowledge Kara Armstrong and her comments because today, coincidentally, um, we will be discussing the issue of Down syndrome and that community. So, but just to start off, I want to say good morning to everyone here. Welcome to my fellow council members, the federal partners, and our guests online, and all those who are live streaming today. I am, yes, in fact, Helen Bundy Metzger. I'm chairperson of the LTSS subcommittee of the Napa Advisory Council on Alzheimer's Research, Care, and Services. As this is my first year sitting in this chair, allow me to make a disclosure. I don't have a slide here, but I am not a medical or a research professional. I'm not a social worker or a government official. I'm a caregiver. 
And I've been a caregiver over the course of many years, caring and supporting my own family members, but also my greater community. Today's topics are extremely personal to me as the lack of services and supports available to my own family members over the course of many, many years had profound implications for them and myself. So to begin, I'd like to briefly define for you what the term long-term services and supports actually is. LTSS is a very, very large umbrella which encompasses both institutional care and home and community-based services covering both paid and unpaid care. It may sound simple, but the breadth and the depth of the reach and impact on the lives of those living with a diagnosis, their designated caregivers, family, and community can never be overstated. So I'm going to expose the tip of the iceberg, and let's look at the economic impact of just unpaid care for those living in the United States. According to the Alzheimer's Association 2023 Alzheimer's Disease Facts and Figures Report, over 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementias, providing an estimated 18.4 billion hours of care valued at nearly $350 billion. With limited access to LTSS, Two-thirds of caregivers have difficulty finding resources and supports for their needs, and 74% say they are concerned about maintaining their own health. From the point of diagnosis of a progressive cognitive impairing disease, through every phase of the balance of one's life, LTSS is essential to support the individual living with the diagnosis, their primary care supports, and their extended network who have and will continue to suffer the impacts to their mental, physical, emotional, and financial health. But the picture is not as bleak as it once was. There are indicators that there are pockets of innovation throughout this country. The American Association of Retired Persons recently updated their LTSS Services and Supports State Scorecard. It's titled Innovation and Opportunity. It rates each of the states in how they are performing in providing LTSS to older adults, people with physical disabilities, and family caregivers. They looked at affordability and access, choice of setting and provider, safety and quality, support for family caregivers, and community integration, all of these essential factors. Although only five states were rated as top tier, the innovation that they displayed could be replicated in others. Another report from the Center for Healthcare Strategies highlighted the unexpected benefits of a state multi-sector plan for aging and offers a learning collaborative that convenes cross-sector stakeholders in collaboratively addressing the needs of older adults and people with disabilities. They build bridges across government agencies and departments facilitate collaboration with diverse stakeholders, raise awareness among policymakers and the public. They create academic, research, and other partnerships and incorporate an aging and disabilities lens across state priorities beyond traditional healthcare and community services. Last July, I stood here before you and have the honor of giving the caregiver response to the announcement of the guide model presented by CMMI, which is the innovation unit under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Guide stands for Guiding an Improved Dementia Experience. It is our country's first major step to see that families who live with dementia every day can seek and find care, services, and supports necessary to help them navigate their dementia journey with the goal of remaining in their home and community for as long as possible. Under current criteria, the models have been tested, the models that will be tested, can enroll those who are eligible under certain Medicare and Medicaid guidelines. There really is no doubt that GUIDE is an innovative program that has the potential 
to well inform how care and supports are provided in the future. However, as hard as we try in every sector and program, there will be those that fall through the cracks. And today we're gonna to discuss some of those. Specifically, those who are too young to immediately be eligible for coverage or access and others who live in the margins of society. So in the first segment of our morning, our speakers will be addressing the challenges and supports unique to those diagnosed with young onset dementia, those under the age of 65. Although age is the strong, strongest known risk factor for dementia, and historically, most have thought of dementia, right, as the disease of the elderly or older adulthood. Our speakers will share their personal experiences of young onset from the perspective of someone living with a diagnosis, a young wife, and a young family. We will also hear about two innovative programs that are trying to fill the gaps in services and supports in their communities. So that will start our first segment. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, John uh, Susan Frick from Rush University. Morning, thank you so much um, for letting me be here. Let me just quickly screen share. And if there's any problems in seeing any of this, please let me know. Um, and what I am speaking on is, as, you, as Helen started to say, the, the long-term services and support challenges that happen for people who are young. And my emphasis has been much on people with young onset Alzheimer's disease. I'll just move this over here. I don't have any disclaimers. I work at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center and have no conflict of interest also. I'm gonna be speaking mainly on um, the information and knowledge we've received from a support group that we've been running for 20 years now. We've just last week hit our 20th anniversary. And it's a program called Without Warning. And um, it's mainly for people with young onset Alzheimer's disease. And it was named Without Warning because we had people with dementia and family members on our task force 20 some years ago when we were starting this. And a, a woman in her 50s who was a school teacher in Chicago um, had just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in her 50s. And we were trying to come up with a title for our support group, and I don't know about all of you, but at Rush, we use a lot of acronyms, and we were coming up with really terrible acronyms for the group. And she said, without warning, because she said that's how this disease came on for her. And I think probably a lot of what you're going to be hearing today, that fits also. You know, we don't, as Helen said, we don't expect people in their... I had one gentleman in his 30s, but 40s, 50s, early 60s to be living with dementia. And so I, we, we thought the title of Without Warning fit perfectly. And so our group has been meeting for 20 years. At, we're a support program, but it was at, at some of our years, we were having 80 people come to a monthly meeting. So that meant we were breaking into anywhere from six to seven, eight different groups at the same time for, we had several groups running for people with dementia and then also several groups for family members. So what I'll spend my time talking about is, is what we gathered from them of what we heard was the challenges and, and also what was beneficial for them. And we had a, uh, a chaplain who helped run our support group and was also an artist. So Shauna would create images based on conversations from our support group. And what I love about the images is they really help to convey the experience and the challenges of living with dementia at a young age. And so I'm gonna use those images to kind of help guide us through what I'm gonna share. Um, and this first image is from the perspective of a person with dementia. And he said for him, Alzheimer's disease felt like he had fallen into this pit and he could see everyone outside of the pit, 
but he just couldn't figure out how to get back to them, which I thought was such a startling image. And then Shauna would often use words that were brought up in the meeting of that day and add them to the image. So that's, you'll see that in quite a few of the images, but that's what you're seeing here. And so thoughts of being left behind, being lost, being isolated, um, but also some positive images too of comfort and quiet and calm is all intermixed in the experience. And so what we sure have seen for people living with dementia at a young age is that it's very difficult for a lot of the people and for the families we'll talk about to recognize what is going on, you know, because we're not often thinking that it's going to be dementia for someone in their, you know, young age. And so it can take some time for people to realize the symptoms to, and then to be able to seek out appropriate diagnosis. Loss of job is in, is huge um, for this group. And the way the person exit work can be something they carry with them and can also have a lot of difficulty for the family as they go forward. Um, maintaining a independence, sense of purpose is is always incredibly tough. I've had people with dementia say they don't feel like they're treated the same since they've been diagnosed. Or I I had one woman say, no one looks at me quite the same now. They, they talk to my husband or they'll look around me, but they don't talk to me. Uh, I had another woman with Alzheimer's say, no one ever asks me how I'm doing. They They just sort of gloss over it. And I think that's one thing we sure have seen in our 20 years of, of doing this is trying to figure out a language for people around them to be able to, to support them and converse with them. Um, loss of medical insurance and navigating that is huge. You know, definitely in our time, um, young onset Alzheimer's has been fast tracked through the disability process, but it's still a challenge for people. Um, changes in communication, ability to perform daily tasks, judgment are all issues for people with dementia. Um, and also how they're feeling, feelings of isolation, um, depression, anxiety can be incredibly high for this group, changes in mood and personality and changes in roles. I, I've had people with dementia say they've never been so tired in their whole life that they just, you know, conversations that for us would be maybe very enjoyable and and would fuel us are exhausting for them. And so I think often we see people with dementia kind of pulling away and not being the same that they were within the family. Um, you know, I our gentleman who actually pushed us to start this program back in probably 20, 2003 was in his early, late 40s when he was diagnosed, and then we met him in his early 50s. And he was the one who said, I don't know where I am, not just in this spot, but in the whole world. And I think that sense of, of isolation and not knowing who they are anymore. Um, I, one woman with Alzheimer's said that she now felt like she was always supposed to be in the back seat. She was kind of talking about a car analogy, but saying, that's where I am. I'm just always in the back seat, and I'm not the person that makes decisions that's kind of driving the family anymore. And that's that's a hard spot to be in, and especially a hard spot to be in at an age when you're not expecting it, you know, um, you know, and when you're not expecting to be slowing down and changing things like that. And so some of the huge challenges we see specific for the person with dementia is is getting that diagnosis. For some understanding the diagnosis, I've I had one gentleman say that he felt like it took him a while to recognize that there was a problem, that he always said people around him saw it before he saw it. And and he was he was a, a from the clergy. And so he he was a kind soul. And he kind he said, I kind of went along with my family, but he goes, I it took him a long time to acknowledge and to see. And for some, depending on how the disease process is working, they might not see that they're having that problem. Exit from work can be a huge issue, huge in being able to access disability. Um, you know, also just for their spirit, we've had some people 
whose exit from work was handled with a lot of grace. But we've had some people who were escorted out of the building and it was seen as a work performance issue. And so that that issue of how we can support or help educate um, places of employment to understand how to to support someone who might be exhibiting some of these signs again, which is hard because you don't expect it at that age. And so that is an issue I hear the person with dementia talk about for a long time, but also the family members. Um, navigating disability insurance, navigating other benefits can be very tricky when you're talking about living with dementia, which as Helen said, is a issue you expect for someone who's older. And so then finding resources and support for someone who's younger is we've seen as being just a huge challenge because the systems are getting better in place, but they still have a ways to go. Um, figuring out their role within the family is just a balancing act through the whole thing. Um, and finding others who are living with dementia at the same age is is a challenge. And I, I think has grown considerably. There's when we started our program, there was there were programs out there for early onset, but not a lot. Um, and often back then, younger onset, which was often referred to as early onset, was often lumped in with early stage programs. So people who were younger could be in programs with people who were older, but early in the disease process. And those two things are vastly different and, and not a great support system for those who are younger. So more, and I know you're going to hear on a program later on too, more programs are, are coming about for people who are young. Now thinking about the family, you know, and these are all intermeshed, but this is a picture that came about from a family conversation because they were saying um, that as the disease progressed, their social circles got smaller and smaller until it was just them and the person with dementia. And you can see the words in this image too are, are hard. Um, you know, abandoned, grief, survival, anger, um, you know, not easy things. And and I, I think this image does sum up so much the what families experience of how their world kind of shrinks and how for a caregiver, so much of their life becomes caregiving and, and having to figure that out. And so isolation is huge for families. I had one gentleman who's caring for his wife and I'm probably gonna see him in about a little bit because our group starts at 10 o'clock here in, in Chicago and just a little bit online. He's caring for his wife who is very late stage now in their early 60s. And he said, you know, if my wife had breast cancer, People would be checking in on us. People would be dropping off food. They would be asking how she's doing. But because it's Alzheimer's or probably other forms of dementia too fit this, he said nobody really asks and no one checks in. And he said the isolation is is just huge. And I've heard that from other people too. Changes in communication, figuring out how to navigate this new world for a family member becomes so hard and figuring out um, I've had family members say they have to learn that they are sort of the the barometer for the mood in the house and and how they are doing has a huge impact on the life of the person with dementia and the rest of the family too. And I've had family members say that's a huge leap to realize that everything sort of falls on them. And especially for that spouse relationship because they were used to maybe doing things more as a team, and now it falls so much onto them and changes in mood and personality. I've often, for younger onset, had families and the caregivers say that they thought they were having marital relationship problems before they realized the dementia because they all they were seeing at first was change in relationship and change in how things were happening. And so it, it often can take families a while to figure out that out too, what's going on. And then here's a uh, image that is from the perspective of children, but I think fits for any caregiver. And years ago, we had a group, a pretty active group of um, 
you know, about 10 young children meeting a variant number. Um, and I thought this image, what they created, fit for all caregivers, even professional caregivers, but they said that they felt like they had to do so much behind the scenes to keep their person with dementia center stage. And so Shauna created an image that's the back end of a stage, and you can see the curtain and the, the light coming down, and, and she, but the image focuses on the back side of the stage. And, and I think that is what a lot of caregivers end up having to do is create the space around or behind the person with dementia that helps to support them. And that's not an easy task to take on. And so you can see, again, all, all the words that are on the stage there um, of, of taking that on. But what else families see as, as being a challenge for people who are young is, is um, financial burden. You're losing an income at an age where you just aren't expecting it. And for a lot of people, they probably haven't, they might not have been making, you know, plans for what would happen if that income stopped. And so we see that as a huge challenge. And some family members are trying to take on additional work, but then also trying to be a caregiver. And a lot of times I sure have seen family members who have to slow up on their work as the caregiver needs increase. And that, again, is a huge financial burden to them. Figuring out how to assist with everyday tasks. I think at the beginning of dementia, the family member is sort of overwhelmed and trying just to take it all in and figure out what's going on. And then as the disease progresses, it's it becomes more hands-on care. And figuring out how to balance that is a challenge. Um, figuring out how to adjust to the changes in the family and in the larger community that taking on those roles that maybe they hadn't done before. Uh, you know, having to be, and a lot of times when we're for younger onset, we're talking about children still in the home um, or, or just beginning to move out. And so helping navigate that for families too, you know, and, and for those children and also for the parent who is having to be the caregiver to this, to maybe the spouse be supporting the kids and often helping aging parents. It's a huge burden for for family members of young onset. And finding appropriate resources is very difficult. There's just not, you know, I often get phone calls saying, where can I find something that's young onset specific? And there really isn't much in the way of resources that are young onset specific because we're not talking about a huge number of people. There's a lot. Obviously, if we were getting 80 people at our support group in us one area, that's a lot of people um, coming just to a support group So and way more that are out there. But it's hard to, to support a, a program that's just young onset specific in a, in a geographical area. That's not easy. And so what are some of the challenges for families? First off, again, recognizing the problem and being able to, to receive an appropriate diagnosis. You know, um, a lot of families are having to work with their primary care physician and, and then figuring out, you know, not everyone has access to a specialist to be able to go for a diagnosis. And so being able to figure that out. Um, learning to balance safety and autonomy, you know, figuring out when do you start doing certain things for, for the family member, for the person with dementia. And, and that's, I hear that, that shift all the time from both the perspective of the person with dementia and the family member. I, I one time had a gentleman, the same gentleman who talked about like he, that he had fallen into the pit, that, that same gentleman, he said to me, I was running the support group and there was about 20 people, it was a large group, in the session. And uh, he turned to me and he said, you know, if you leave the fire, the um, oven or stove on, people just laugh about it. But if I leave the stove on, people tell me I can never touch it again. 
And I thought, you know, that is so true <laughs> that we get to make mistakes. But people with dementia, if they make a mistake, it's often seen as we need to take this away. Which as a family, I was a family member to my parents, not young onset, but both had dementia. I get that <laughs> perspective of you're wanting to keep someone safe. But I think that balance of safety and autonomy and allowing the person as much independence as possible in the situation is a huge, huge juggling act and, and something I see families and the person wrestle with a lot. Finding appropriate ser support and services for legal and financial matters is difficult um, and and a huge part of what what family members often and the person um, have to start thinking about and and families do it in different ways some not doing as much as they probably should and some really focusing a lot on that but finding the right person to be able to help them navigate through that um, is is a challenge figuring out as I said earlier what type of disability, you know, whether they go through their place of employment, if that's appropriate, or whether they go through, you know, um, the dis being de declared disabled through um, the government, figuring that out is, is often a challenge for the families. Um, and balancing, as I said, balancing work in the caregiver role and finding support programs. Because I think I sure have had families say to me, you know, I, I run the support group, but I also work at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center where we have a memory clinic and where people come for a diagnosis. And I hear from them a lot of how overwhelming it is to receive the diagnosis and then be sent back out home. And, and so being able to provide them with support services is really important. They they say, you know, that's, and I think they're getting, it's a lot to take in and whether there be staff at the place where they're diagnosed that can check in, you know, whether there's a social worker or someone who can then help guide them through support services, that is very helpful to them and a challenge to find those. One thing that I think is a benefit, I don't know if the word is benefit, but has helped us to readjust with COVID is a lot of programs are now online. And so, you don't necessarily have to be in that area like our program now had been for people just in the Chicago area, but now anyone can, because we're doing it on Zoom. And so anyone can join in from anywhere. And I think there's a lot of programs out there like that, that, um, you know, have that, that ability to take in people from all over, which is, is helpful. So the common re programs or resources that families are seeking for dementia and young onset dementia is home care, daycare, respite, um, residential placement if needed. Not everyone goes that route, but, but finding assisted living or skilled care that will work for young onset, and then palliative care and hospice. And again, finding these programs which can be supportive of people who are young. What I often see for young onset Alzheimer's that we've seen in our support group is for some that are placed in a facility or even in a daycare program, you're talking about someone who's young and, and often physically healthy in regards to someone who's much older. And so someone who's young can be, you know, sometimes um, difficult to place among people who are maybe more frail. And so I sure have seen people who are dismissed from programs because they've knocked someone over or that it's been difficult to have them get, you know, be among someone who's older and frail. That's, that's a trick, tricky part for people with dementia. And then thinking about this is the final pain. This, and it's a little harder to see in this image, but this was an image from also a gentleman with dementia who said about su support groups. He said, I love coming here because we're all in the same boat together. And it's, it's a little faded, so you, you can't fully see it. But the idea of the painting is that on the side where the person is alone, the, the sea is more rough and, and um, the waves are harder and it's darker. And on the side where people are grouped together, the waves are a little calmer and the sun is coming out. 
And so realizing how important it is to, to have people be able to be in community with others. And so we need to help, help that um, create those spaces, create more support programs, um, help educate the community. And I'll talk about a couple programs we're involved with, but, you know, having family and, and neighbors and friends and the greater community realize how important it is to stay connected with people with dementia and whether that be in faith communities or just groups and clubs and events um, and then support programs. Um, you know, I, there is an incredible, like, what I often see for this experience is the, the immense loneliness. And so if we can create more community, the better. We in Illinois are involved in these two initiatives, and I know probably a lot of you across the country are, but there's Dementia Friendly America, which is helping to create communities that think about how to support people with dementia. There's over 400 communities and growing across the country. In Illinois, we are now up to 36 communities and actually one more joining in just a little bit. And what I love about this grassroots initiative is it helps people become actually interested and in a way excited about finding ways to support people with dementia in their own community. And so that's, I think, very important. Here, let me just make sure this chat is not to me. Um, um, and, and then the next one, let me just, I'm just about done because I know my time, um, is dementia friends. And I would suggest that all of you take a moment, um, if you haven't already, and sign up as a dementia friend online. This is a grassroots initiative. It takes only 10 minutes if you go to DementiaFriendsUSA.org to become a dementia friend. And what I like about this initiative is I think it's one of the first community awareness programs across the country that's looking at quality of life and looking at how do we make the world around people with dementia and families more supportive and, and helping people with um, in a community realize they have a role and they can do things to help support people with dementia. And so, you know, it's a, it's a global movement, but it's a movement within the United States and we've been focusing on it a lot in Illinois. So giving talks and having people sign up online. So I'd, I'd encourage you just as in your roles to, to do it so you're aware of what is out there for um for families and and for the community. So I think it'd be worth doing it just just in your own role. Um, and then these are just um, programs and and support that's from our support group. Just so you're aware of them and know of them, we you know have our support program. We meet weekly for caregivers. We meet monthly for the people with dementia. Um, and as I said. We used to be a local group, even though we had people that drove a couple hours to attend our sessions, but now we're on Zoom. So anyone, we have people that Zoom in from all around. Um, so that is available and feel free to share that with families if you have. Um, we also have our website, which the main reason I suggest it is it has a lot of video content about the experience of dementia and something you can share. We we did a lot of filming with people through in our group throughout the years and you can share it with families and it there's a lot of video clips about all different aspects of the experience of younger onset dementia. There's also a documentary documentary we created several years ago and actually Dr. Randall Bateman's a part of it. Um and it's called Too Soon to Forget. It's in a it's a documentary that looks at uh, we film just with people in our support group and it looks at the importance of community in in this saying that this is still a rough experience no matter what a you know no matter um, the age but community helps and and looking at what are the different aspects of community and then we did create a website that is for people who are running support groups. Because I sure know, I worked in long-term care before working at Rush, 
that a lot of times in long-term care and other places, people are running support groups who maybe aren't trained to run support groups, but are good, kind souls <laughs> and are running the support groups. And so this is a website that is, um, gives resources to people to help, to help who are running dementia support groups. Um, so that, hopefully I stayed within my time enough for you, all of everyone, um, but that is, that is my presentation. Um, and I appreciate being able to kind of kick off the morning for all of you. Susan, I wanna thank you on behalf of the council. That was really, really comprehensive. You covered a lot of the highlights that I know personally, my siblings, because I've lost two siblings to young onset, they personally experienced and went through. And I know others here that are gonna be coming forth to present, will, this will absolutely resonate with them. Um, I saw a lot of acknowledgement here in the room, so you've done a fine job. So I hope you can remain with us. I hope it will not, you know, the discussion portion in a little while hopefully won't uh, interfere with your having to rush to take care of your support group members. If I duck out I, at about 10 o'clock my time, I have to duck out. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank so you. We're, okay. We're going to move on now, and we're going to hear the voices of those who are experienced living with dementia, young onset, and then we'll move on to the caregivers. So I'd like to welcome Brother John Richard Pagan. Had no switch to turn on. Okay. Can you all hear me yet? Okay. I'm also very good at projecting, so it shouldn't be a problem. Unfortunately, I'm having a very good day today, so that's a plus. My name is Brother John Richard. I am living with uh, Lewy body dementia. And our topic today is about young onset dementia, but just so you know, I'm also... Um, Besides the dementia, I am also a veteran. Um, I'm a part of a minority group, Latino, uh, as a Latino. Um, I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. Um, and although I wasn't single when it, when it happened, I am single now, and I live with a very unique situation in in um, as caregivers, uh, because my parents are my caregivers. And we don't often talk about, we talk a lot about spouses. We talk a lot about children being care partners. We don't talk a lot about aging parents having to take care of their children. My father is 81. My mother will be 80 uh, this coming uh, July. They too are going through changes. They too are going through cognitive changes, very serious changes right now. Um, I could relate with my parents. A lot of the things that were just uh, explained uh, were just mentioned about relational conflict and all. So I see that I live in that and I live in a very confused world right now in my home. Um, but a little bit about me. I, and, I had already, by the age of 40, done a lot. I had already been a travel agent. I had gone from working as a travel agent to working for the airlines in their software program to going and becoming a network engineer for 10 years and then owned a coffee shop for four years. I decided I wanted to do more. So I went ahead and got my clinical psychology master's and became a marriage and family therapist and was working on my hours when I decided not enough. So I went to, on to work on my doctorate degree in clinical psychology. At about age 46, 47, uh, working on my doctorate, I started to have cognitive issues. I started to um, get very confused about what I was hearing in class quoting people incorrectly, the professors make statements and I would hear it completely wrong. Um, 
I would I deal with statistics, advanced statistics, and I was getting advanced statistics, uh, advanced statistic problems correct, but I wasn't able to get the, uh, to explain how I got there. I couldn't remember the basics that got me there. My, my dean told me that I was just overreacting, that I was just stressed, that it was normal behavior for, for uh, newer students, even though I'd been a student on and off for several years. Uh, he said I, this was normal. I wasn't happy with that. So as a veteran, I went to the VA system and I asked my psychiatric nurse if, if he would go ahead and help me with this. And he did some tests. Uh, and found that I had a t adult tension deficit disorder, which I had never had before, uh, and um, an expressive receptive uh, communication language disorder that was new. So they went and had me tested further and found I had a, a mild cognitive impairment at that time. My school didn't care. They said that I was being lazy. They said that I was being uh, overcommitted to uh, external act extracurricular activities, and they dismissed me from my program. It was the most painful moment for me. My car was repossessed because suddenly all my funds that I was getting weren't in, and I couldn't make my car payment. And I had to make my rent, so that became my priority. And I had to just figure out what I was doing. We hoped that this would all turn around, and then I found out that, that they didn't think it was going to turn around, so that I was probably going to get worse. So I came back to Virginia, where I hadn't been for 30 years. I'd lived on my own, most of it. And I came back to Virginia to live closer to my parents so I'd have support. My um, boyfriend at the time, a year later, came to move with me. And yes, we had a lot of relationship issues that... I hadn't even thought about could have been related to my changes. I moved in with my parents because I had nowhere else to go. Um, I'm fortunate enough I do have a VA disability check. And I tippy toe with that all the time because that's for some that's for another disability. And I'm always afraid they're going to take that from me because they can say that the dementia is what's causing me not to work. I tried to hold down a, a part-time job, and it was exhausting. I would go home after 20 hours of week, of week, and I would just fall asleep, and I wouldn't eat. And then I'd be back at work the next day. Um, my energy level isn't the same. Young onset dementia has really been a challenge because of the fact that um, I have no place to go to, well, until yesterday when I talked to Sherry, uh, I've been told that I'm not eligible for uh, Social Security disability because I was in school the whole time. I didn't have a lot of work credit to, to, to get Social Security disability. And so I couldn't get that. And then I was told by them that because of that, I couldn't get Medicaid, Medicare any of those benefits. And that's what a lot of us are told. Um, it's not true. There are avenues I'm learning, but I have to find those avenues now. Um, I lost a friend who was 34 years old to suicide because he was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. And then they said he was too young. So they canceled his diagnosis. So he had to fight with Social Security disability and trying to get benefits. And he had an eight-year-old son and a wife, and he felt like a complete letdown to, all, to both of them and couldn't face the world. And they actually did an autopsy afterwards and found him riddled with Louis. He was only 34. Only 34. We forget the young person. We often say old people or older people, and we forget the young. 
I tried to go to a, a senior center just so I could get out of my isolation. And I was told I didn't qualify at that time because I wasn't 55 and older. I said, but I living with a dementia diagnosis and it didn't matter. This was the policy. Things have to change. We have to do more. Do you know that in Europe, there is a, they, they actually have a better count of how many people approximately have young onset dementia in the UK and other, and other countries? I tried to find that information for the US so that I could have it today, and it's not there. That's a problem because the percentages in Europe suggest that the number is high. And the more that we diagnose people early, the more we're going to see young onset is showing up. They're now saying 10 to 20 years prior to full symptoms, people are actually have these mutations of, the, of proteins and all in their system, already creating change. As a single adult, I live in isolation in my parents' basement. I watch my mother cry because she doesn't know how to support me and support my father who's going through changes. And she doesn't know what to, deal, what to do with the arguments they're getting into and how to keep me safe. I can't, don't know where I'm going to go if anything happens to my parents. Because as a person with a young onset, my brother and sister still want to know if I'm lying, making it up. I work with my church as a, a church leader, which always amazes me that they put that trust in me. But I recently heard from, from one of them that Several people in my church have, have lived with the idea that I'm faking it because I'm too young to have dementia. My own neurologist, I won't say where because we're too close. Um, so my own neurologist, when I first went to see him, said, you're too young. You don't have it. And he let me go. And I actually, before, when I was sent back to him by the VA, I, before I would do anything, I sat with him and I said, you practice ageism. And that doesn't work. And we had a long conversation and he finally said, I'm sorry. And he goes, you're absolutely right. And according to the records, you have Louis body. We need to see that. We need to know, uh, we need to be able to see those people acknowledge that, that something is different, that things are changing. We're not seeing people at the end of their diagnosis now and thinking it's an old person disease. We're seeing them at the beginning. I would love to go back to school. I really would. I'm bored. I have nothing to do. I'm only 57 years old, 58. And there's no place. And Dr. Fink, was it? Um, Dr. Fink was right. I went to an Alzheimer's Association group meeting, but it was a bunch of older adults with their spouses. And there was very little relationship. There was very, I couldn't relate to a lot of stuff. And I hear my friends talk about what do they do with their children? How do the children handle it? And I sit here actually now saying, thank God I don't have children. Something I wanted all my life. And now I think it's a blessing because I, I wouldn't put a child, my child through this. I can't do it. But I'm putting my parents through. And I have nowhere to go. I'm looking at uh, what do I do for assisted living or senior living, and my budget doesn't afford it. I didn't have time to make those plans. 
to, to do a long-term care insurance or anything else. So I have to deal with what I've got. As a veteran, I can go to a VA facility for care. But as a gay man who was dismissed from the VA because I was gay in the 80s, during a time where they hunted us down by going to clubs with shore patrol and, and finding who goes there, I don't trust enough. And I ask myself, do I have to go back into the closet in order to receive any type of benefits? Do I have to go to a place that I feel unsafe in order to receive the services that I'm going to need? And that scares the living daylights out of me. Young onset dementia changes lives. It, I don't want to say living with dementia is terrible. I don't like that message. And I say that because I live life one day at a time. And because of my spirituality, my, my human connection through the church and through uh, Zoom, I believe that life should be lived. And I try not to think about long term. I live in the day. And so I try to make it the best I can. But it's hard. It doesn't work every day. With my parents right now, we're dealing with what roles are what. I'm afraid to show my parents when I'm having bad days now. Because I know my mother can't take it. And I know my father, although he doesn't mean it, acts like, like I'm a burden to them. He's going through serious changes, especially in the evenings. And I have to sit and hear the fighting and try to keep the peace. Even when I want to crumble and say, I can't take another moment of this. We need to work on better, better resources, better way to take care of the children left behind by young onset, the spouses that are struggling and losing their lives to this because they're now the caretakers and they have, to, and they had full-time jobs. And what do they do? They, do they resign from their jobs? We have to take care of the young onset person who is kicked out of their jobs because their their company didn't want to deal with the insur the disability insurance, so they just found ways to say you're not performing. We have to do better so that someone like me can complete that doctorate with assistance. We have to work better. My name is John, Brother John Richard, and I'm living with young onset dementia. I'm living with Lewy body dementia, both physically debilitating and cognitively debilitating. And I want you to know that I need to be visible to you. I need to be someone you see instead of someone that you pass by. So thank you for letting me share. Brother John Richard, your everything that you covered hit so many tones, I know, in many, many hearts and minds today. Um, you've been part of marginalized groups, minority groups, veterans groups, and yet with everything that we have been putting forth in the way of LTSS, your needs aren't being met. You're living in a unique situation because elderly parents are now stepping in. And as, the, as that time goes on, you see changes in them. And what does that mean? So every day has doubts, 
it has fears. And so we as a society and community need to be doing better to embrace you and others. So and the one point you did bring up, and I'm going to just highlight that before we move on, is the issue of suicide. It's not one of the topics today, but the numbers that I've heard over the last several years that the incidence of suicide in young onsets is relatively high. And if the community is, does not reach out and embrace, we lose these people. So I wanna thank you for actually highlighting that. Um, it's exceedingly important, but we do have to move on. Um, and so, yeah, I know, I don't wanna, we could sit here and chat about these things for some time, but I certainly want to welcome our next speaker. Um, Katie, I see you there on the screen. So our next speaker is Katie Brandt. She's coming in from the Boston area. And so Katie, the stage is yours. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Well, can everyone hear me? Wonderful. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm Katie Brandt. I'm the Director of Caregiver Support Services and Public Relations for the Massachusetts General Hospital Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit. But today I'm going to share with you my personal story as a caregiver. Next slide. So here is a picture of my husband, Mike, and I on our wedding day, uh, just a few months after graduating with our bachelor's degrees. Uh, at this moment, I was the only one of us who had a job, um, but we had a used Buick from my parents and a one-bedroom apartment full of furniture from my grandmother's house, and we were ready to take on the world, um, planning ahead for a future that we saw as being bright and full of promise. Next slide. Uh, right around our fifth wedding anniversary, we found out that our love was too big for just two people, and our son Noah was on the way. Uh, that center photo is just surely a shameless, uh, gorgeous baby photo that I just love to include in <laughs> my presentations. And Mike loved uh, that picture of the two of us together, telling people that my belly never got as big as his. Um, and I always admonished him that that really wasn't something to be proud of. But uh, he certainly was proud of our growing family. There's a picture of our little uh, three-bedroom house. And we, our jobs had turned into careers. Uh, Mike was working as a theology teacher at a lo local private high school. I was working for the Division of Children, Youth, and Family as a program specialist in New Hampshire. And we were just thrilled to be living a life that was rich with community connections and family. Next slide. It was around the time of uh, my pregnancy with our son Noah that I started to notice changes in behavior and personality. So for example, Mike started getting in trouble at work because he wasn't meeting the dress code. Uh, he had to wear a tie as a teacher, and he wouldn't wear it. And he was getting verbal warnings, written warnings, and then was at risk of suspension from a job that he loved because of not meeting the dress code. When I spoke to him about it, he said to me, I just don't want to wear a tie. Not really a rational explanation for why a new dad would put his paycheck on the line. I started getting phone calls from Mike's friends saying, is Mike mad at me? Uh, he never wants to talk or hang out anymore. 117 hours is not enough. Mike developed some perseverative behaviors around the Harry Potter audiobooks. Uh, he would listen to them from the beginning of the first book all the way through the end of the seventh, which is 117 hours of audio. Um, and that sort of uh, perseveration, addiction, connection with those audiobook stories was so pervasive that, in fact, when I was in active labor with our son Noah, I said to him, take those earbuds out of your ears. And Mike was uh, an amazing student. He loved to read, would often read three newspapers a day, and then uh, we would talk about current events over dinner. Uh, he could translate text from Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And one day we were sitting together making a grocery list, and he could not spell the words rice and avocado. Next. 
Excellent. So I brought Mike to see many clinicians. He saw two primary care physicians, three counselors, two psychiatrists, and one neurologist in the span of six months. He stayed overnight at the hospital and spent a week in a secure psychiatric unit. He had many tests. But it wasn't until I brought him to Boston uh, to see the chief of cognitive neurology at Beth Israel Deaconess at the time, where he received an accurate diagnosis of behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia at the age of 29. And, you know, while this was a difficult experience for me as a caregiver, I am often struck by the incredible privilege that I brought to this difficult journey. I had excellent health insurance. Um, I was a strong advocate. English is my first language. I always had a car and the ability to take time off of work, paid time off of work, uh, to take Mike to these many appointments. When clinicians would tell me that they thought he was depressed, um, I felt strong enough to say to them, that doesn't make sense to me, and then seek additional opinions. And so thinking about all of those extra advantages that I had, which is what led to Mike being able to get that accurate diagnosis. And how can we reduce barriers for other people uh, to help make their journeys to an accurate and timely diagnosis faster? Next slide. In the background of uh, difficulties with Mike, my mom started sharing with me some challenges for my dad, um, who was a 59-year-old veteran, how he got lost in our local neighborhood and uh, lost on the way to my sister's house for dinner one night. He was just extremely, extremely forgetful, um, would tell the same stories over and over again. For the first time in his entire career, he got a negative performance review at work, and when my son Noah was born, it took him 13 weeks to learn the name of his first grandchild. Next slide. It's a picture of my lovely parents, Tom and Diane, with Noah. Um, so what happened was um, about four days, it was four days after Mike's diagnosis of behavioral variant FTD, that my mom passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack in her sleep. And it was just 17 days after that, that my dad's diagnosis of young onset Alzheimer's disease was confirmed. Next slide. And so at the age of 29, I found myself responsible for two adult men with uh, progressive neurological disorders and young onset dementia and my infant son. And so for me, there were some immediate and severe consequences of care. Uh, I made the decision to step away from work to meet the very intense needs of my family. And uh, this move to full-time caregiving and leaving work entirely meant that I wasn't eligible for uh, TANF, right, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, because I was not seeking work, I was not underemployed, I was a family caregiver. Um, unable to make payments, I lost that little house uh, to foreclosure. I ended up spending our retirement savings and really, you know, benefited from the social safety net with WIC and um, Social Security and EBT SNAP benefits to just help make ends meet. Um, I lost connections, right? When people talk about how isolating Alzheimer's and related dementia diagnosis can be, it's also isolating for caregivers. Your world can become very small. And so I found that I wasn't able to keep up those connections that I had developed, professional or personal ones um, that I had developed over years. Next slide. So thinking about what are the real costs of care? You know, the costs of care are not just what is the ticket price, what's the entry to an adult day health program or uh, a memory care assisted living. The cost of care is also the loss of income. The, the cost of care is the loss of contribution to community and society. While I was giving an incredible gift to my family as a full-time family caregiver, I felt removed 
from society and isolated. I was unable to contribute professionally or engage with friends the way that I used to. So, you know, many employees um, find that they have to reduce their hours, uh, reduce leadership responsibilities, or step away from work entirely. Uh, there was a, a great study done supported by the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration, led by Dr. James Galvin, that looked at the cost of young onset dementia and found that, in fact, it's almost twice that of Alzheimer's disease. And why is it? Likely because young onset caregivers who are still working need to hire and engage with um, they need to hire caregivers or pay for adult day health programs to care for their loved ones while they're working full time. And they need to do that earlier and at higher levels than people who may be retired and caring for their loved ones. Next slide. So in many ways, I felt like this was my mind as a caregiver. Just so many overwhelming things to think about at all times of day and night. And so this really gets to many, many of the things that you see on this list, navigating legal issues, health insurance, medical appointments, education for myself. I had never heard of frontal temporal dementia, behavioral variant FTD, until the day that my husband was diagnosed with it. And when I decided to leave work and step into a caregiver role, suddenly I was called upon to be an expert in this area. And also while I was navigating being a new mom. And so I had this very interesting experience of kind of traveling these two tracks. And to become a new parent, there are so many things built into society uh, to connect us as parents with young children, programs, and they're all very positive. And you're looking towards the bright light of your child's future. And I found that in contrast, what was offered to me uh, around education for being a caregiver of loved ones with dementia had this very different trajectory that seemed very ominous, negative, depressing. And so it takes quite a lot to have the emotional resilience to find joy in each day, to focus on making those connections when you're feeling overwhelmed. Next slide. Today, in my role as Director of Caregiver Support Services, I get to work one-on-one uh, -on -one with families. I also get to work with clinicians and provide education around helping to manage and work with families around navigating life lived with dementia. And what I often say to our clinicians is that when they hand out a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, FTD, or related dementia, they are actually going to see two patients walk out the door. What we know is that being a caregiver is a threat to your physical, emotional, and financial well-being. Um, we heard uh, Susan Frick talk about the loneliness that people feel. You know, we do not have a cure today uh, for dementia. We have advancement in treatments, but we don't yet have a cure. But we have a cure right now for the isolation and loneliness that may come along with a diagnosis. And that is both for the person living with a diagnosis and their caregivers. And so as a society, we have to think about what are the things that we can put in place right now? Where, is, where are the funding mechanisms? What are the policies? What are the programs that we can put in place to protect caregivers from having physical emotional and financial impacts from a disease that isn't even contagious. And so what is it that we can all do to make changes in that area? Next slide. Mike passed away on April 19th, 2012 at the age of 33, just over three years after his diagnosis, 21 days after our son Noah turned four, and only months before he might have celebrated a decade of marriage. Mike lost the ability to speak, walk, and swallow, but he never lost his voice. As Mike's wife, I was his biggest advocate, and it is my honor today to continue that advocacy in Mike's memory and on behalf of other families walking the journey of young onset dementia today. Next slide.
I became determined uh, that FTD would not have the final word in our family's love story. Um, And so it has been such a privilege to speak about my experience, to connect with families, to raise awareness, funds, and hope that the cure of tomorrow is not so far from the care of today. Uh, And it really has been a wonderful experience to share that with my son, uh, Noah, who today is 16, um, uh, terrifying me with his learner's permit and um, growing into an impressive young man. But here he is um, (laughs) helping me with some of my advocacy efforts. He's a great companion. And, you know, what it has really been for Noah is for him to know that his dad's life was very important. And that just because we were unique, we're part of a smaller population, a rare population to experience FTD and dementia at such a young age, it doesn't mean that our story is not important. Next slide. So I'd love to just leave today saying that um, just because dementia, a diagnosis of dementia has come into your life, it doesn't mean that joy has to go out. Next slide. I am so lucky to be part of a clinical research program that really values the idea that all care does not happen in the clinic. And so while we need scientists and clinicians to move as fast as they possibly can towards disease-modifying therapeutics, we also need connection with the community to help us right now, immediately, to feel more connected, more cared for, more welcomed, so that personhood and dignity is respected and embraced at every stage of life lived with dementia. Uh, There's Dr. Brad Dickerson in the tuxedo uh, right in the front. Uh, This was last year at our eighth gala uh, to benefit the MGHFTD unit. And I'm so proud to have created uh, community events that help people to come out and make new memories of joy. Next slide. So I just want to thank everyone um, for listening to my story. Thank you all on the Napa Council for the work that you're doing. And um, I'm proud to be connected with such a wonderful group of tenacious clinicians, advocates, and scientists. Thank you. Katie, I want to thank you. Um, What I loved most about your story is, you know, the love never left. You fought through it. You know, young onset can result in many families with a family break. And you fought through that. Um, And the word joy is something that resonates with, I think, many of us. It is the simple things in life. It is remembering that no matter how dark some days can be, that there is always light. And so I want to thank you for sharing that and continuing your advocacy for, you know, and and bringing Noah up in that. (laughs) He will be a wonderful young man going forward, knowing that how much his parents loved each other and that um, he has a role in this world to share with others. Yeah, thank you. So we are going to move on to our next speaker. Unfortunately, um, Diana Shulikos is uh, un- unavailable to speak live. However, she did submit to us a video last evening. So staff is going to go ahead with that. Operating Lorenzo's House is a trusted organization and the global hub of connection resources and light for young people and their families walking with younger onset of any form. We are growing faster than we imagined. And as we grow, we listen to the voices of our community, our young people, those living with or has lived with a parent with young onset have become our compass at Lorenzo's house as they understand more intimately than anyone this condition and they are our next generation of experts and advocates. So let me hand off 
uh, this presentation to our community at Lorenzo's house. My name is Off. My dad has younger onset dementia. My name is Shyla, and my father has younger onset dementia. Hola, mi nombre es Luis Cordero, y mi mamá tuvo um, inicio temprano de demencia. Hello, my name is Erwin Comforst, and my father has early onset dementia, Alzheimer's. Hi, my name is Kevin Kelly, and my dad has early onset dementia. Hi, my name is Robin. My mom has younger onset dementia. My name is Matia. My dad has on younger onset dementia. My name is Olivia. My dad has younger onset dementia. My name is Nito and my dad has younger onset dementia. My name is Jalen. My dad has younger onset dementia and every day I hope to shift the narrative and bring light with my Lorenzo's house family. After my first connection with Lorenzo's house, it felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulder, truthfully. Um, I have met so many beautiful people and they're also navigating this difficult journey with grace and we just help each other tremendously. Our tagline at Lorenzo's house is we bring light. And the idea is that we are shifting the narrative. Our mission at Lorenzo's house is to empower young people and their families affected by younger onset dementia of any form. We are shifting the narrative and we're doing this by building community where there once was none. And we're curing isolation with personal connection and we're driving dementia justice, a world where families affected by dementia are seen and understood and embraced. Our design model is virtual and includes three pillar programs, our match, our clubs, and our summit. Our match is our proven care partner to care partner model. My connection with Robin was an instant relief. Someone my age that knew what I was going through without even having to explain my whole story. Our stories were so similar, knowing that I can call or text someone in a moment of celebration, concern, grief, sadness, and happiness, and they'll pick up and just get it without having to give all the extra pieces and information that's needed to truly understand the impact of those situations. It's like nothing I could have ever imagined and that I could ever find. The light in our match is knowing that I'm not alone in this journey. Our clubs are virtual spaces to share common stories and exchange insights and find community. We host monthly light clubs for our youth. We host a brunch and a lounge for our care partner spouses. And we just started our Shine On session for those whose loved one has passed. After Light Club, I feel calm, relaxed, and ready for the rest of my day. Light Club helps me to think deeply. I listen and share, and it gives me a place where I can discuss my dad's condition and get tips and ideas from other kids that would make life easier. It is a good place. Everyone shares similar experiences, and we can all relate to each other. When I was 10, I found a light. The Light Club has helped me learn how to show light to my dad and how to cope with all of my stress and emotions. One of the best parts of uh, Light Club was learning from people, young people at different stages of the, the journey um, and being surprised by things that we're worried and scared about may actually surprise us as being a moment that brings us closer to our loved one. Um, but then also a, a, a powerful moment within Light Club was realizing we all have very similar questions that sometimes aren't asked um, and the, this idea that we can come together and try and answer them we'll figure out what resources there are to answer. Our camp, which has evolved to our summit, our youth summit, is a worldwide virtual event designed and led by our young people at Lorenzo's house who have a parent living with or has lived with younger onset dementia. Me and my mom were out to lunch one day. We brought this camp idea and the camp is to bring kids like me and my brother who have a parent with Alzheimer's together and have them connect with one another. Hi everyone, my name is Jalen and I am honored to serve as the MC for Lorenzo Z Summit this summer. As a daughter to a father living with younger onset dementia, I understand how isolating and complicated things can be and how hard it is to find peers who understand. Our free summit is exclusively for young people who have a parent living with or has lived with younger onset of any form. It's a way to give these kids support and a community of other kids also going through the same thing 
and so that if they're ever having a hard day, they can reach out to someone in the camp who knows exactly what they're going through and have someone to talk to about it. In closing, Lorenzo's House would like to thank you, Napa, for devoting today's agenda to younger onset dementia. I spent last week at the Alzheimer's Disease International Conference in Krakow, Poland. I was graciously invited to spread our Lorenzo's House mission as a conference keynote because, because there is a global urgency to pay attention, to look up, to respond to the data that shows younger onset dementia is real and on an uptick, and to dismantle the layers of dementia stigma that leave younger families behind. We are here, millions of younger families navigating this diagnosis nationally and globally, and no longer do we need to live in the shadows. And that is why it is so imperative that we emphasize to all who influence our national dementia plan, HHS, the many interagency groups and the Advisory Council on Alzheimer's Research, Karen Services, it is imperative that we emphasize the importance of increasing awareness and support to young people and their families affected by younger onset dementia of all forms. At Lorenzo's house, we wake up every day and directly address goals three and four of our national dementia plan to expand innovative supports to families and to enhance awareness and target underrepresented groups. Though we need to strengthen these plans to ensure they truly represent the voices and unique needs of younger people and their families. We cannot overstate the urgency for younger families at this time who are either ineligible for benefits because they are too young or navigating the complexities of brain change in their home mid-career on one salary with small children and no place to find community and relevant resources. I cannot tell you how many times young people finally find Lorenzo's house and say, you know, where have you been? It's, there's hardly a resource out here for my family and virtually nothing for my kids. Just yesterday, I spoke to a spouse, a medical professional actually in Canada, who told me she searched and searched for a place and just found us and is eternally grateful that she found a community for her 34-year-old wife and three small children, 17 months, three years old, seven years old. We have so much connecting to do because when we are connected, as warrior families, really, warrior families walking this diagnosis, we have a lifeline when we find each other, someone who understands, and, and it's a way to support each other on our way through. So Lorenzo's House is a small nonprofit with big dreams to solve this massive societal problem and build community for young families affected by dementia. We urgently need local and federal support to work together to build structures, design resources, and spread awareness, ultimately creating a community that drives dementia justice, a world where families affected by younger onset are seen, heard, and embraced. Let's do this. The time is now. Thank you. I want to thank Diana Shulikos and her team. Uh, I became aware midway through that our live stream did not have audio. Um, they did get the second half of the recording. Um, so I want to inform everybody out there on the live stream that the video will be available at a later date. Um, and you know, on our website, on the Napa links. So um, we, you know, hopefully, um, we can get that information out to you. So in the meantime, in an, in an opportunity to kind of catch up on our schedule here, we've had speakers that have had to drop off due to timing constraints. Um, so, Katie, I want to thank you, um, but we aren't going to have discussion now. We are going to delay it till after our second segment. Um, and for the committee members, we're going to try to take a five-minute break. All right, thank you all. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.